Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I'm Dorothy Bracey with the Friends of History, and I'll be serving as your host today. These monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by Friends of History of the New Friends of the New Mexico History Museum and through donations from our members and from our audience. We do, however, surprise, accept, encourage donations. These funds go directly to support the lecture series and other programs. Should you wish to donate, please go to our website and click on the donate button on the top of that page. Our speaker today is Dr. Shelby Tisdale, the recently retired director of the Center for Southwest Studies of the Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. Before that, Shelby was director of the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, and before that, director of the Millicent Rogers Museum in Taos. During all that time, she's been very much involved with NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and she serves on its review committee. Um, all of this did not keep her from scholarship. She has written over 40 books and articles, concentrating on the Southwest's art and particularly on women of the Southwest. Relevant to both of those is her biography of Pablita Velarde. Um, her wonderful book, Spider Woman's Gift. And um, her most recent book, No Place for a Lady, the biography of Marjorie Lambert. So I'd like to welcome Shelby Tisdale. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Dorothy. And I do want to also thank uh, the Friends of History uh, for inviting me to speak to all of you today. So um, my discussion is going to be focusing on Marjorie uh, F. Lambert, Ferguson Lambert, and, and mostly her role as uh, the curator of archeology span at the Museum of New Mexico. So I'm excited to be here and to talk about uh, my dear friend Marjorie. And I think what I'd like to do first is, is just give you an idea of how Marjorie and I met. Um, I was first hired uh, as the Assistant Collections Manager at the Indian Arts Research Center at the School of American Research in 1983. And of course now uh, it is called the School for Advanced Research there in Santa Fe. And um, I started um, working as uh, focusing on the collections at the Indian Art Research Center that were primarily part of the Indian Arts Fund collection. And Marjorie um, and I met shortly after I was there sometime in the summer. Uh, she and her husband, Jack Lambert, um, we're both um, getting up in age and uh, Jack was having problems he with his hearing and Marjorie was having problems with her sight. And um, once in a while, um, Jack would, would fall and Marjorie was having difficulty getting him up. And so they decided to um, move Jack into an assisted living situation and Marjorie uh, decided to move into her own apartment. And so they had this beautiful collection of Indian art and decided that one of their goals was to eventually donate the collection to the Indian Art Research Center at the SAR. And I was um, one of the ones that went over to the house to start packing up, uh, especially the pottery and some of the other, um, especially uh collections that had to do with um, Hispanic art and uh, bring those back to the school. So that was how I originally met Marjorie and Jack. Then um, after Marjorie and Jack had, had moved, I would go to um, Marjorie's apartment uh, 
and bring her back and forth to meetings at the SAR. She was currently, she was on the board at the time. And also the, the SAR had these wonderful brown bag lectures at lunchtime. And uh, Marjorie just loved going to those. And so I would go over and I'd pick her up and, and bring her to the SAR. And during those drives back and forth, um, she and I chatted a lot, but one of her biggest concerns was losing her eyesight. And as her eyesight got worse and worse, she was having a really hard time reading, even though she had a, a reading machine um, and she had books on tape. But um, but those were pretty limited um, in terms of archaeological reports and, and anthropology uh, articles and so on. So um, I volunteered to, to help her um, read. And so I would go over to her apartment and, on Wednesday nights and uh, Wednesday evenings, I'd go after work and we would have a light dinner. Sometimes she would fix dinner. Sometimes we would go out to have dinner. Uh, and one of the first things I read was the newest um, annual um, report that the School of American Research Press had put out in 1984 called New, New Light on Chaco Canyon by David Grant Noble. And this was an edited volume and uh, had a lot of really interesting articles about Chaco Canyon. So that was the first thing I read to her. I also would read books. Um, Margaret Mead, uh, Blackberry Winter was one of the books I read to her. Other books included um, books on primate, primates, because she was very interested in primates and the gorilla studies and so on of Diana Fossey and um, Jane Goodall and so on. And she was also very much a supporter of, of some of the primate centers. So after I left the SAR, I completed my, my master's and uh, went off and, and worked in, in, in museums and I decided at one point to, to go back to school to get my doctorate. And I went to the University of Arizona in Tucson. And um, I was very fortunate to get a research assistantship with Nancy Parizo. I had known Nancy through my work in museums. I would see her at conferences like the American Anthropological Association conferences or at the American, what was called the American Association of Museums at the time. And, um, and so when I went to the university and um, of course I went and, and, and saw her as soon as I arrived and, and she was working on, just starting to work on a project that was um, coming out of a earlier project that she and Barbara Babcock had done called Daughters of the Desert. And this project was um, uh, an exhibit on women in anthropology, the, the daughters, and Marjorie was one of the daughters that was included in this project. Um, there was also a, a catalog published, as well as a conference that was held in 1986. And so when I went to the university in 1989, um, Nancy was starting to put together all the conference papers to develop it into a volume that she edited called Hidden Scholars. And I was able to work with her on that, on that project as, as a research associate. And I did a lot of um, bibliographic kinds of interview um, information gathering and, and things like that for this publication. And uh, while we were working on this publication, I got to talking to her about some of the women that were involved in the Daughters of the Desert project and thinking there needed to be more written about some of these women. And because I had been um, already uh, associated with Marjorie, I was thinking that Marjorie would be one of those women that really deserved uh, a full um, a full publication on on her life and her contributions. And so during this time period when I was working for Nancy, I would be going back and forth to Santa Fe from Tucson and always got together with Marjorie whenever I did go to Santa Fe. And uh, one day I asked her if she would be willing to let me interview her and possibly write um, 
a biography about her someday. And, and of course, Marjorie was very humble and, and didn't feel she was worthy of, of a full biographical uh, publication. But over time, as we talked um, and I learned more and more about her, I realized that I could probably uh, write a full book on Marjorie. So I started um, by tape recording our interviews. And altogether, I had over 40 hours of interviews that I was able to take with her. And um, and then I also started putting together her life, um, her early life, as well as her archaeological life, and then her, her contributions in museums. And, um, and finally, you know, was able to, um, to publish the book. And I will talk a little bit about that towards the end of my discussion today. So a little bit about Marjorie's early history. Um, she was born in Colorado Springs in 1908. She was um, a descendant of one of the pioneering families who uh, settled into the Pikes Peak area in the early 1800s. Her, um, her father uh, was actually born and raised in Scotland and he came to Colorado Springs and uh, married um, uh, Marjorie's mother, who was one of the the pioneer, part of the pioneering family, and um, they started a hardware store. And um, her father was a very, very well educated and well read man, and he would send Marjorie off to uh, the library, especially when she was in high school, and um, she had an interest. Um, that developed while she was running back and forth to the library, picking up books for her father. She would also pick up a lot of books for herself. And she came across this one book on Egyptology and she just totally became intrigued with archeology span and thought, well, one of these days I'd like to, I'd like to be an Egyptologist. So, um, and she also picked up books on the Southwest. She had A.B. Kidder's book on, on archaeology of the Southwest. And she also happened to come across uh, some of the books, some of the publications by uh, Sylvanus Morley on Mesoamerican archaeology. So she got, again, even more interested in archaeology and uh, started thinking that might be something she could do. After graduating from high school, she attended Colorado College. Um, it was during the Depression. Her parents really could not afford to, um, well, they just couldn't afford to send their children somewhere else to go to college. So all three of her, um, well, all three of the children, including Marjorie, attended Colorado College. While she was going to school um, at Colorado College, she was taking anthropology classes. She was working in the museum there. She was also um, continuing her, her interest in Southwest archeology. span And some of the faculty at Colorado College would invite archeologists and anthropologists from other universities and other parts of the country to come to the college to give lectures. And oftentimes these um, professionals would also go to private homes to give lectures. And two that came very often because I think because they were so close um, was Edgar Lee Hewitt, who at the time was the director of the School of American Research and the Museum of New Mexico as well as he was on the faculty at the University of New Mexico. And the other uh, that came often, uh, and sometimes um, he would come with Edgar Lee Hewitt was Sylvanus Morley, who was also um, at the time had an office at, uh, at the Palace of the Governors and um, did a lot of work with Hewitt and, um, and also um, was a colleague among many others at that time in Southwestern archeology. span During this time, she got to know Edgar Lee Hewitt fairly well and, and Hewitt was very impressed with this, this young woman. And, she, and so 
he convinced her to go to graduate school at the University of New Mexico and, and to um, start out in, her, in his field school. And so in 1930, when she graduated from, um, from Colorado College, she headed out that summer of 1930 to go um, to, to her first field school, which was sponsored by uh, UNM as well as the SAR and Museum of New Mexico, because Hewitt was uh, responsible for all of them. And he ran this particular field school. It was held at Battleship Rock, which is in the Hamas Mountains. And um, this, uh, there's a great photo here of the camp. It was pretty, it was pretty rustic. It was, but it was in the mountains. It was cooler. It was, there was water available. And uh, it was, is quite a, an interesting site. Uh, first of all, in 1930, she worked at Unshagi. And then she went back again the following year of 1931 and worked at Nanashagi. And Marjorie, anyone who ever met Marjorie um, knows this particular saying. She often said, once I got my hands in the dirt, I never left. And um, it was something she, she repeated often. And, and I think it was just something that uh, it was so true of her. She loved archaeology. When Hewitt was running his field school at Battleship Rock, he also ran a field school at Chaco Canyon. And uh, the field school in Chaco Canyon was specifically set, set up for uh, the more advanced graduate students. Um, uh, so he would um, oftentimes take some of his graduate students who would be working at Battleship Rock and then bring them over for the latter part of the field season to Chaco Canyon. And, and of course, Marjorie uh, in 1931 was considered an advanced graduate student. And so she was invited to come out uh, to Chaco Canyon Field School at that time. So she worked part of the year at Nanashagi and then, or part of the summer and then part of the summer at, Canyon, at Chaco Canyon. And I love this photo of her um, at Pueblo Benito. Um, one of the things the students often did in the evening after uh, being out in the field all day is they would go over to the trade. There was a little trading post right there at, uh, at Chaco Canyon. And they would go through all the textiles and the jewelry and, and uh, baskets and so on. And, and uh, Marjorie bought a silver uh, concha belt uh, while she was there. And she just, she loved it. Even on the back of this photo, she says, look at me in my new concha belt, which I, I love. Um, and it's, it's just this great photo. She didn't work at Pueblo Benito. The field school at that time was working at Chetro Kettle. So she worked in the excavations in Chetro Kettle and, uh, but the photo was actually taken at Pueblo Benito. After she finished her, her master's thesis and uh, had graduated in 1931, she continued to work at Chaco Canyon while she was teaching at UNM. Uh, she, she was given a faculty position uh, teaching anthropology classes. She was also running the, um, the lab where all the archeological collections were coming in. So she worked a lot in, uh, with others and, and training students on how basically to manage those collections. And so they spent a lot of time cataloging those collections as they came in from various field schools that, uh, that of course, um, Hewitt was running. In 1932, um, she ran her first field school um, by herself. This was in, um, in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Here she is just in a, in a rental that she had in Santa Fe while she was working in Las Vegas. She was going back and forth and um, she ran a field school at Tecolote, uh, the Tecolote site um, where they did summer excavations. And this was called uh, New Mexico Normal University, which of course is Highlands University now. It was uh, just outside of Las Vegas, and she had um, a field crew that was primarily of Native American and Hispanic um, laborers who had worked on some of the 
sites that um, that Hewitt operated. Um, and also a lot of this, and then of course the students from the class. Interestingly enough, she was told by her, her fellow male students that um, because this was her first time ever running her own excavation, um, they told her she would never find anybody to work for her. And, and she definitely proved them wrong. She was able to pull a full crew together and, um, and they did a lot of really good work. So she, you know, she kind of uh, went against the grain at the time. Um, when she was in, in the field schools in um, both, in, in particular at Battleship Rock, when she first got out there, um, the male, uh, the the men in the field that were running the field school for Hewitt refused to teach the the women any kind of field techniques. And so Marjorie actually learned her archaeological excavation techniques from uh, her Native American um, colleagues who were in the field at that time. So um, despite the fact that, that her male uh, peers didn't want her to to really learn how to do archaeology, she figured it out and she learned. And there's there are wonderful stories in this book about um, her time at Battleship Rock, uh, some of the antics that she and her colleagues, and actually some of the faculty members, uh, like like um, Krober, who was um, at the field site at the time, some of the antics that they would pull. Um, um, and, and it's, it's just, it's, they're great stories. I don't have time to go into them today, but, um, but she tells, tells these wonderful stories of being in the field. Um, so I wanted to just point out some of the projects that she worked on in the, um, early half of the 1930s. Um, these were sponsored by UNM, the SAR and Museum of New Mexico, and um, these were all uh, these were all projects she worked on while she was still teaching at uh, at UNM. Kwa Rai uh, was one of them. Kwa Wa, of course, is corn at Coronado State Monument, or, or I guess State uh, Park now. Um, you can you can certainly go to to uh, the state park and see Kwa Wa. It is. That was where they had uh, found the paint, the painted kivas. She also worked in 1935 at, at um, Guisiwa in the Hamas State Park. And probably she is best known from this time period for her work at Pa'ako. Um, she was sent out in 1936, uh, worked out there during the winter. And um, it, was, it was an interesting project and interesting in a number of ways. Um, just because of its location and, and its age, it's a site that was owned by the University of New Mexico at the time. She was um, really interested in, in um, trying to figure out the stratigraphy of this particular site and also wanted to learn more about the agricultural aspects of this particular community. Um, but they were not able to go beyond the fence line of, of the property that was owned by UNM. And this was when she really, she just admired Edgar Lee Hewitt so much. And he was such a mentor to her. And he really was so good to her and gave her lots of opportunity. Um, but she was very frustrated in his approach to archaeology, and it really came out during her excavation at Pa'ako. Um, and I go into this quite extensively in the book. She, uh, she was working, a, a, a excavating a test trench to try to figure out the stratigraphy of the site. And um, at one point, Hewitt came out to the site and asked her what she was doing and and she was very excited about about this and and was finding out some really interesting information about the site and Hewitt's remarks uh, remarked that well you're wasting your time we don't care about stratigraphy we don't need to know that i just want the stuff he was interested in collecting artifacts for the museum was the bottom line and so um 
she was really frustrated and she said, I'm not out there. I wasn't out there treasure hunting. I was out there to understand the archaeology, the history, the prehistory of this particular site. And so that was, I think, her first kind of realization that that Hewitt was not kind of that that person she had put up on a pedestal that 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 she had. So it was, it was an unfortunate situation for her, but um, uh, she kept up the good work and, and carried on. Um, here's is a, a picture of her out at the site um, working uh, with, her, well, I guess there's really not a picture of the crew, but um, at this time period, she did have a ch uh, chance to go up to Santa Fe for a couple of months uh, she would go back and forth periodically, and and um, Hewitt had brought had brought her up uh, to learn a little bit about the museum. And during this time period, she went out uh, to a party at uh, at someone's home who was on the staff at the museum, and uh, she met this young well young man. His name was Jack Lambert. And he um, was totally smitten with with Marjorie and, of course, asked her out. And so they went out. Their first date was uh, to go out to a um, uh, a site called Sankawi out by uh, Bandelier National Monument. And uh, he took a picnic and and uh, they walked around the site and they realized that they had a lot of, in common and shared interests. And sh then she went back down to UNM and he would come and visit her now and then and, and take her out. And finally she realized, you know, he's an older man. He was 11 years older than her. And her mother had once told her, don't ever date an older man because they're no good. So she just dropped him and and uh, stopped dating him. And and that was it. So unfortunately, it was quite a long time before she would run into Jack again. But uh, but that's a, a little later in the story. So in June 1937, after she was while she was still actually working out at Paco, um, Hewitt decided to move. Uh, Marjorie to the Museum of New Mexico up to Santa Fe. She was one of the first two women in the Southwest to be cu become curators of archaeology at uh, at major museums. The other was Hannah Marie Wormington, um, who was uh, the curator of archaeology at the Denver Museum of Natural History. And both of these women had. Um, had a lot of of obstacles thrown in front of them. Um, Marjorie was replacing a man, a male, who um, who Hewitt decided to move back down to Albuquerque, um, and that created some friction among some of her male colleagues at the museum. Um, Marie. Uh, Marie Wormington had an even different and more difficult experience. She uh, was a paleontologist, well-known paleontologist, doing great work. And um, her male direct museum directors uh, kept trying to to um, get basically get rid of her because she was a woman, and they felt that a woman should not be in that position. Uh, that a male should be. So she fought against that her whole career, but she managed to um, to stay at the Denver Museum of Natural History. Marjorie, similar kind of thing. She didn't have problems with the directors as much as as her male colleagues. And part of part of the issues that both women experienced, and I think this is true of of women in anthropology and archaeology at that time. Um, pay equity was a huge issue. Marjorie never, ever made what her male colleagues um, and peers made in the museum. Um, the other thing, too, is there were just a lot of times when things were additional responsibilities were given to to Marjorie in particular as she um uh, worked in the museum. Uh, she became kind of the, um, because she was curator of archaeology, she became the um, uh, 
secretary of the uh, museum, the the Archaeology Association of New Mexico, uh, kind of on a de facto level. And she was uh, not only the secretary, she was also responsible for developing all the lectures for, for the association. And she, which was a lot of work for her. And she also had to entertain the speakers and oftentimes take them out to dinner and pay for it herself. Um, and that used to frustrate her a lot because she wouldn't get any help from her male colleagues. Her first office was in the Palace of the Governors and she actually um, occupied the office that J.P. Harrington had occupied early on. And, um, and she would hear all kinds of stories. I guess Harrington actually lived pretty much in the office. I mean, he would sleep there and, and, uh, and make food. And, and some of her colleagues would say, oh, yeah. Uh, well, Savannah's Morley actually told her that, uh, oh, yeah, when he would come in to see Harrington, there would be papers all over the floor. And there was nowhere to even sit or walk when you walked into the office. So, um, so it was kind of a, kind of a mess. Um, but that was her first office. And she loved the Palace of the Governor. She loved the building um, and she loved being part of that. When she first started working um, at the palace, of course, the, the exhibits at that time, and this is across the board in all museums, were more like cabinets of curiosity. And, and this particular photo that was taken in 1940, of the um, Hall of Archaeology is pretty much what it looked like when when Marjorie started. I mean, they were just cabinets full of stuff, uh, no interpretation, no labels, um, just just uh, collections of things, um, artifacts. So her life in the museum um, started out, as I said, as the curator of archaeology. She also was in charge of the Palace of the Governors for a, a time period. Then she became curator of anthropology and exhibits. And then she was the curator of research of the research division. And at that point um, in 1959, she took an office out at the Laboratory of Anthropology. So as I said, you know, originally, a lot of museums were just cabinets of curiosity, just a lot of things in, in cabinets and, and drawers and things like that. And um, one of the things Marjorie was really at the forefront of at the Museum of New Mexico was doing interpretive ex ex exhibits. Exhibits that had themes, that had stories to them. Um, she did exhibits on particular sites, uh, archaeological sites. She um, and she loved doing the exhibit work, and and especially the part that had to do with interpretation. And that was because she was she was so um, adamant about teaching and and teaching not just anthropology but also history through interpretation. And that was her her way through lectures, through the, through the exhibits um, that, that she found her educational outlet after she left the University of New Mexico. The other thing too that Marjorie was at the forefront of uh, was what we call um, ethno-archaeology where, um, and ethno-history where um, we as curators, um, work collaboratively with descendant communities, especially Native American communities as our collaborators. And so she would ask um, her Native American colleagues, um, you know, interpretive questions or questions about how she should represent them. And that was, that was something that was unheard of at the time. Um, so I think she was really kind of at the forefront of that kind of work. She gave a lot of public tours. Um, she enjoyed them. Um, she she also um, would would talk to different um, 
different communities of people. I mean, there were the public tours, but also there were, during the war, there were servicemen and their families. And, uh, and so she, she, and she tried to represent uh, her exhibits um, as, as places where people could feel comfortable and safe and, and uh, learn something about their, about their culture and their lives. During the war, World War II, um, not only was she working full time at the museum, but she was also volunteering. Uh, she volunteered for the Red Cross uh, Motor Corps, and she would take um, nurses as well as patients um, to to the Bruins Army Hospital. Um, and she would take some of the recovering servicemen out to Pueblo feast days, which, of course, for a lot of these servicemen, uh, they were not from the Southwest, uh, really didn't know much about um, Native Americans at all and um, and would be surprised when they'd go out to these Pueblo feast days to see so many Pueblo people and and learn about their foods and so on. And um, it was always kind of interesting to her because this was just something that was so familiar to her. Um, during this time period, I go into great detail about this in the book, but um, Hewitt decided to send Marjorie out to do field work. And she was frustrated because once she started working in the museum, she wasn't getting out to do any archaeological field work. But um, and in this particular project, uh, she wasn't really happy about because of the timing. It was during the war. It was um, and he sent her out by herself and she had to go out and find a couple of men from uh, the Pueblo to work for her. And uh, the, the, the time of year was not good either. It was right at the very end of October, 1st of November. So it was right at at the time of Day of the Dead, which um, the people at the Pueblo people uh, at Okeawingi in particular um, uh, revered the dead and, and had different ceremonies related to that. So she, her project was to try to locate Ayucayayunque, which uh, it was thought to be the Spanish capital of New Mexico. Um, and this was in 1944. I won't go into, again, a lot of detail, but it was a horrifying, terrifying experience for her. Um, and, uh, and it was not a good experience, although she did find, she found the site. And unfortunately, the site was being um, bulldozed uh, for, um, uh, to make uh, adobe bricks. And so she was able to at least recognize that the site was going to be destroyed and did something about that. I mean, she came back and reported it and, and that, that activity did stop. So, so that was at least something good did come out of that project. Um, some of her extracurricular activities, um, she was very involved in a lot of different organizations in Santa Fe, um, New Mexico Association on Indian Affairs, Santa Fe Indian Market, the Indian Arts Fund, Spanish Colonial Arts Society, um, and so on and so forth. And she, uh, she, and and once she and Jack got married, this was uh, she continued to be very actively involved on these, in these organizations on their boards and um, and so on. She also um, was very. Um, involved professionally uh, with uh, other archaeologists across the country. She attended a lot of professional conferences and meetings. She especially loved uh, the Pecos Conference, which is held here in the Southwest uh, every summer. And, um, and here's a picture of her with Bertha Dutton and Florence Holly Ellis at a Pecos Conference. I believe this was at Gila Bend, and um, it was in 1954. And then um, I, when I was living in Santa Fe, uh, I was able to take Marjorie out to um, some of the Pecos conferences, especially ones that were held uh, within driving distance. And uh, so we went out to the Pecos conference. This one was actually at uh, Pecos National Park.
One of the projects that she was able to do while she was in the museum was to excavate the well in the patio at the Palace of the Governors. And uh, this particular, this was really interesting because she, um, she was the one who um, designed this whole uh, uh, wood structure that uh, where they could, uh, somebody would go down into the well and they had this mechanism for bringing the, um, the buckets of, of um, material and soil up out of, out of the well. And what they found were things like ink wells and uh, oh, uh, broken pottery, things like that. There was a um, post office at one point that was in the Palace of the Governors. And, and her thought was that, that a lot of that material came from, from that, that post office. In 1960, Marjorie received some funding from the SAR. She had put up, um, in 1959, the SAR was kind of in a process of reviewing its current situation, what it had done in the past, what it needed to do in the future for recognition. And it was decided that they wanted to sponsor archeological projects again. And so they requested uh, proposals from different archeologists and Marjorie um, sent in a proposal to do a uh, survey and excavations in Hidalgo County, uh, New Mexico. And it was accepted. She got a $10,000 grant in aid and she was able to hire some graduate students and Richard Ambler. And they went down to Hidalgo County in uh, July of 1960. And Hidalgo County, where they were working, is in the area of what we call the boot heel of New Mexico. It's down around Deming in that area. So this, there was very little known as far as, as you know, the scientific and archaeological value of this particular area. It had been extensively looted, and of course, this was um, an area where there was a lot of membrace pottery, and so that... Uh, that had a huge market for collectors. And so um, it was, a lot of those sites were destroyed um, from the looting. And so Marjorie was the project supervisor and they, they documented over a hundred, about a hundred rock shelters and caves. And these were primarily in the Alamo Hueco mountains. And three of these caves in particular uh, are, are important because they were excavated. And one is Ubar Cave. And some of you might be familiar with Ubar Cave. That was where um, they discovered a, um, a hairnet made of human hair that was over 150 feet long. And they also, uh, found a basket that had um, um, hair as well, uh, just um, inside the basket. And then, of course, this figure that uh, they weren't sure what it was, if it was a kachina, katsina, um, or what it was. Uh, and it was made out of wood and painted. And Marjorie took it out to a number of different pueblos as well as photos to different people asking if they recognized it. And, and in the Pueblos, they said, no, it's not, it's not from here. And so Marjorie really figured it probably came from Mesoamerica. And there's been some research on it since uh, that related to a Tlaloc figure that you would see in Mesoamerica. It was during this time that Marjorie also was starting to make a lot of connections between Mesoamerica and the Southwest. Um, she was really at, at the very, I think at the, some of the forefront of that, she uh, admired the work of Charles de Peso at Casas Grandes and, um, and just with her excavations, as well as working with collections, she was starting to see more and more material that was either from Mesoamerica or related to Mesoamerica. Um, another cave was Buffalo Cave, which had a, uh, the reason it's called Buffalo Cave is it actually had a painted uh, buffalo on the back of the, in, on the inside of the cave. And then there was Pinnacle Cave. So I'm going to come back to Jack now. 
uh, Jack Lambert, um, in 1950 was in Santa Fe and was at a grocery store and happened to see Marjorie and realized he was still smitten with her and went and asked a friend of his at the art museum uh, what her marriage status was. Well, at this time, Marjorie had gotten married um, to someone that one of the students that was in her Tickelode field school back in the 1930s. His name was George Tishy. And the marriage did not last very long as far as, as uh, they're living together. Um, Marjorie had some issues uh, with his, his alcoholism and, and spending money. And so she decided to separate from him, but she stayed married to him. And she did that more for protection than anything else. As a married woman, she figured she was, she, she would not be, um, harassed as much. So she stayed married to him and she was still married to, to George Tishy when, when in 1950, when, when Jack saw her. Well, Jack convinced um, George Tishy to divorce Marjorie and he actually paid him off to do it. And so Marjorie was able to get the divorce from, from George Tishy and marry Jack. And this was, you know, it was just a beautiful romance. They had a wonderful life together. They shared so many interests. And Jack, I think, was was interesting in his own right. He was a cowboy. He was a dude rancher. Um, and I do talk about a lot of his life in this book as well. He was also a builder, and he was the estate manager of the um, White Estate, uh, the White sisters, Amelia um, White in particular, uh, kept Jack on uh, as her, her estate manager after her sister passed away. And of course, that property is now the property where the School of American or School for Advanced Research is, is located. But Jack would take dudes out um, to various parts of the Southwest. Uh, of course, there were no fences and so on. It was still pretty much open country. And here's a perfect example of one of his dudes, Mary Cabot Wheelwright. And this was a photo that was taken of them out near Soap Creek in Arizona in 1927. And of course, Mary Cabot Wheelwright uh, was the one who started the Wheelwright Museum of, um, I think it was called the Museum the Museum of Indian Religion was when she first um, built the museum and it has since changed its name to the Museum of American Indian. But Jack, you know, just um, I think some of some of you in Santa Fe might still remember Jack. He was kind of referred to as the last true cowboy of Santa Fe. Um, and they spent a lot of time with their Native American friends and their Hispanic friends. They um, they had they they uh, had the house that's just up the street from um, right up the street from the school for advanced research. The houses the house is now the Lambert house has now uh, become uh, uh, one of the scholars' houses for uh, for scholars that come to the SAR and the old stables the uh, have been converted into another apartment uh, named after Marjorie. So um, they're, they're still remembered by the SAR, which I think is just wonderful. And Marjorie and Jack did receive the Living Treasures of Santa Fe Award in 1988. And I was so fortunate to have been able to join them when they received that award. And I think, I can't think of a couple more deserving. Uh, they both gave so much to the Santa Fe community um, from an intellectual perspective, but also just for their love of, of everything having to do with Santa Fe. When I went, uh, when I completed my, um, my doctorate in 1997, I came back to Santa Fe as a scholar at, at the SAR in July of 1997. I was able to spend another month and a half with Marjorie and also uh, to start writing chapters 
of, of the book. I was really lucky that I was able to read these chapters to Marjorie, get her input. Um, oftentimes she would have things that she wanted to um, adjust or edit or add. And um, because I was able to work with her one-on-one -on -one so much, um, I was this this book became more of a book of her stories and and her voice became central to the whole book. And then I built more of her her history and the history of of the um, you know the the history of the development of of American archaeology, especially in the Southwest, as well as all the characters who were involved with that, and more detail on the work that she did as far as archaeology and working in the museum and her contributions as well. Unfortunately, we lost Marjorie in 2006, but you know, she was almost 100 years old. She was 98. She, um, she always kept saying, are you ever going to finish this book while I'm alive? And I was like, oh, I don't know. It's getting, <laughs> it was getting close. And here, almost 30 years later, I finally uh, was able to finish this, this book on Marjorie. Um, so here's the book. Um, it's No Place for a Lady, The Life Story of Archaeologist Marjorie F. Lambert. And this was just published by the University of Arizona Press um, this past month in June. And um, if you would like to order the book, you can order it from directly from the University of Arizona Press. I have their website address here. Um, or you can go to Amazon.com or another possibility is possibly through your local bookstore. And I know since this is being filmed um, ahead of time, pre-recorded, I'm not going to be able to entertain questions from the audience today. But if you do have questions, um, please feel free to reach me at my email address, which is sjtisdale at gmail.com. I'm going to leave this up a little bit. Um, and I think we're going to turn it back to Dorothy. Um, I think she might have a couple of questions for me. Thank you. Okay, Shelby, one question I had. You're from Canada. How did a nice girl from Canada end up in the southwest of the United States? Good question, Dorothy. Um, when I was a little girl, I collected horse figurines. I loved horses. And I loved westerns, and I I was raised in the in the um, in the Great Lakes area in Ontario, and I always dreamed of coming west. And so, ironically, as uh, as we moved to the states, my the company my dad worked for um, transferred us to the U.S. And uh, once I finished high school and uh, came West. I, I moved to Denver. I mean, it was like, where, where would you go if you loved horses? You'd, you'd go somewhere like Denver, right? So, so I moved to Denver and, um, and I just, you know, I always just loved the West, but in particular the Southwest. And, and the longer I lived here, um, the more I learned about, about the West but also, when I was a little girl, I also had a fascination with American Indians, Native Americans, um, and even in Canada. Um, when I was when I was in elementary school, we had uh, Indian children bust in from seventy miles away to come to my school, um, and I I had friends, and um, I always. I was always intrigued with with their culture, and so I think that once I got to to Colorado and especially to New Mexico, when I moved to Santa Fe, I I started to learn about the pueblos and and meeting people from the pueblos, and uh, I I've always just found home here, and 
and I never left. I mean, I never wanted to leave. So I've been different places in the Southwest and I'm now in Arizona, but, um, but that's kind of what drew me out here. First was kind of the wild West and horses. But uh, once I got to, to know more people who lived, who lived here uh, for thousands of years, I really learned to appreciate more of what the Southwest had to offer. One other thing, you mentioned both the beginning and at the end that um, at the end of her life or well before the end of her life, uh, Marjorie became frail. Her eyesight left. Um, she could not get her hands in the dirt anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and yet she made tremendous contributions to the field and to Santa Fe after after she was no longer a dirt archaeologist. I, I think many of um, my colleagues who are watching this, who are themselves retired, <laughs> thinking of retiring, <laughs> would love to hear about what a full life she lived and how much she contributed. Thank you for that question, Dorothy. Um, she, she really did live the full life. I mean, and it's, it's interesting too, because when she was growing up, of course, this was a time period in the early 1900s where the expectation of a young girl or a young, you know, young woman, if you went to college at all, was you were going to go into social work or you were going to be a librarian or maybe a teacher. But the expectation was you're going to be a homemaker. And um young women like Marjorie, who who did not follow that path, had to deal with a lot of um, a lot of discrimination, a lot of um, a lot of sexual harassment. I mean, there were not laws protecting women in the workplace from sexual harassment. And Marjorie and many of her female colleagues talk about this in terms of well, you just had to put up with it because your male colleagues, your male peers would just say, well, if you don't like it and you don't like our jokes or you don't like this, then then go find another job. Or, or if the pay equity issue is such a big deal, um, go find a rich man and marry him was kind of the attitude back then. And I think for her, she had such a fighting in instinct. She was, um, not only did she belong to all of these organizations, but she also, for example, fought um, for Native Americans, uh, in particular at like Indian Market, where, you know, there were no places in the early days of Indian Market in Santa Fe. There were there was no place for these Indian artists to to stay. They'd have to camp out. There were no restrooms. There was the I mean, it was just unbelievable what these poor artists had to endure in order to come to this market. And so Marjorie and her colleagues pulled together and and worked really hard to to change that. And another um, thing that Marjorie did during the war, she and some of her, her uh, friends that were part of this, these organizations uh, pulled together and there used to be a gas station um, across from um, the old Connie's there at, uh, uh, what is that? I think it's Palace and, and uh, Darn, I can't remember. It used to be a gas station. Anyway, it was they converted the gas station uh, building into a place where these young men who were coming through Santa Fe could get together and have coffee, a place to just sit and talk and relax a little bit while they were waiting for their next bus. Um, and a lot of these young young men were were. Um, Native Americans, they were, they were Apaches. They were, they were leaving home and going, you know, off to war. And Marjorie um, would become pen pals with many of them. So that was just, you know, I mean, it's just one of many things. And then even after she retired, 
uh, she stayed involved with these organizations and she stayed involved with the SAR um, and became uh, an emeritus board member. But she continued to stay on that collections committee until even when she was um, in an assisted living at El Costillo, she would still get out and, and go to different meetings and, and sit on boards. She, um, she also walked a lot downtown. I mean, she had just enough sight that she could see um, to go downtown, walk downtown from El Costillo. And it really it wasn't until she was not able to get around anymore when she was in the nursing home part of El Costillo that she stopped pretty much all of her activities, which is about the last, I would say, 10 years of her life where her sight just was so debilitating. She just couldn't, um, she couldn't really do much anymore. Shelby, thank you so much for being with us, for telling us so much. And I have to say that one of the wonders of modern technology is that anybody who wants to can watch this again, along with so many of our other previous lectures for, that would, uh, for First Wednesdays of Friends of History. If you go to our website, friendsofhistorynm.org, um, you can watch this lecture and others. Just go to the lecture series link and then past lectures, and there you are. Um, and you, from that website, you can learn a great deal more about Friends of History, including how you might join us and become a member of this wonderful organization. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you in the months ahead. In the meantime, thank you and goodbye.